Hello and welcome to episode 34 of the Page One podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco and thanks again for joining us. If this is the first time you're listening to the Page One podcast, thanks for tuning in. At the Page One podcast, we like to speak to writers of all kinds, authors, screenwriters, comic writers, video game writers, any kind of writer, to find out how they broke into the industry, what their writing process is, and chat a bit about their work and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. There's a big back catalogue that we've now started building up of, of yeah. great episodes there. So, you know, there's people like Richard Morgan, Sarah Pimbra, Mark Billingham, Peter James, Laura Lamb. There's loads of episodes, so please uh, do check out the older episodes if this is your first episode. Um, I hope you're all doing okay this week, uh, continuing onwards through through lockdown, or I think <laughs> people are now coming out of lockdown yeah, around so the world. Yeah, I think we're finally so, starting yeah. to see the light at the end of the tunnel, Yeah, perhaps. hopefully, hopefully <laughs> that's going to happen. So who's on this week's episode, Tarek? This week we are chatting with Thomas Welsh, who uh, was a very nice chat. He came along to meet us just before the lockdown happened. That's so right, this was yeah. actually our last episode recorded in the same room as someone, yeah, I think, before that's right. insanity. <laughs> before, when we were uh, in the same room as well, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, Mr Welsh is the author of Anna Undreaming and the sequel, Anna and the Moonlight Road. Their first two parts of what he calls the Metics Fade trilogy and it's kind of an urban fantasy story uh, he's also a lead writer on cloudpunk which was a video game which was released fairly recently i think a couple of months yeah or so. it was the end of april i think it came out yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's meant to be i haven't played it but it's meant to be great it's, yeah it looks great the uh-huh. guardian said one of the best games of the year so far uh-huh. so yeah definitely yeah. worth checking out yeah so we we chatted to us about all of that stuff uh, it's a really interesting chat and he has lots of sort of hints and tips for starting out and how to break in because he, in both of those industries, he's gone in a, a slightly unusual route. He's not got an agent for his novels, and the way he got the the, the writing gig for Cloudpunk <laughs> is quite quite incredible. But we won't spoil that. We'll we'll let you find out what he says about that. Um, but it was it was really interesting to us. Yeah. Um, so and what we will say is that we have a competition this yep. week. So we have a couple of copies of his book, Anna Undreaming signed copies mm-hmm. uh, to give away so we'll let you know how to enter that at the end of the episode yeah and you can also win with the Anna and Dreaming book uh, a, your own very own page one notebook which is the writer's notebook that we designed which <laughs> is how can I forget that price? exactly <laughs> uh, which is uh, divided into uh, separate sections for characters plot and so on with special templates and things like that you can check it out on our website the link is in the podcast description but we're going to play a very quick advert for page one and then we'll get straight on to uh, speaking to Thomas and we'll speak to you again at the end of the podcast. See you then. The blank page. To some it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome, but we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. 
and then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Have you always had an interest in writing? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So when I was at school, um, I remember getting a lot of feedback from my English teachers because I kind of loved it, you know. Every day we'd do early out at lunchtime and play football and I'd be like, I want to keep writing my wee story. Um, so I got a lot of feedback from teachers in school. Yep. You know that thing, I think some people get it, like they get on quite well with their English teachers, so they're like, oh Tom, you read this book as well, you yeah. know, they'll give you like a wee book. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're the keen one, you can tell. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I liked that. I, I don't know if it was any good, um, but I, th I thought I was. So I had that wee bit of confidence, you know, you're maybe the best in the class or something like that. Um, and I always thought that I would do it. You know, I thought it would just happen automatically. Yep. Yeah. And then you get to this stage when you get a wee bit older. I'm going to be 40 this year. So I started writing properly maybe four years ago, three years ago, say. You get to this stage where you're like, actually, if I don't do things, they're not going to happen by yeah. themselves. Yeah. And the things that you're planning and doing, they went from like more likely to happen to like <laughs> the, the, the switch yeah, is flexing. Sure. Like, yeah. probably not. You know, yeah. I'm probably not going to play football professionally. <laughs> um, not that I ever was because I was always picked last. But there's still that wee bit of me yeah, that goes, yeah. actually, I technically, if I wanted to, though, yeah. too old. Like, just, just not possible. Yeah. Not, not going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so there was that wee thought where I was like, well, this isn't going to happen automatically. Yep. Um, so, yeah. And. So you said you started uh, four years ago properly. I mean, what is it that prompted you to to sit down and say, right, I'm actually going to give this a proper go? Well, it's a kind of funny route to it. So I think a lot of people that write, it's funny that um, when I was talking to you, I think it was before we were recording, yeah. mm -hmm. you both described yourselves as like either writers or aspiring writers. Uh -huh. And I do quite a lot of workshops and kind of creative um, writing kind of sessions. And one of the things that I tell everybody is like, none of you are aspiring mm -hmm. because you've came along. And I assume if you've came along, you've got at least some interest in writing. You know, writing can be lots of different things. It can actually be sitting at the desk and writing, or it can be thinking about writing. Yeah. It can be just starting the process, you know, planning out a story. You've got stuff in there. So I always tell everybody, go to your Twitter, go to your Facebook, mm -hmm. go to your Instagram. Just, just say writer. Just, just delete that aspiring. Yeah. It's like, a fair what? point. I mean, because yeah. how do you say, when you be, when do you stop becoming an aspiring and actually just, you know, what's the, there's no definition for when you become a writer. Yeah. Is it? it's, yeah. When you delete that aspiring, yeah. that's you. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair um, point. But for me, I, I wrote like, um, so it's almost like you're playing at it, I think, for most people. Yeah. And some people, I, I think because of like the whole imposter syndrome, I think mm -hmm. even people far more successful than me still say that they feel that like I'm just playing, I'm, I, I feel yeah. like I'll feel legitimate one day, but I don't right now. Yeah. So for me, it was, it was literally playing at it because I wrote like a wee story for my wife and I got it printed, like, you know, you yep. can go to one of these websites and print it, make it look like a real yeah. book. So it was like the first three chapters of yep. the story. I was like, this would be a nice story because it's like kind of wee funny characters and there's loads of wee references and wee in-jokes only she would get. Yep. But I found that in the process of writing that, all, all I really needed was an audience of one person. It's quite a low bar of success. <laughs> it. But if one person's reading this, then that's good enough for me. Yep. And I was like, man, I really love this. I'm having a great time. So I wrote that story and I gave it to her and then I was like, I kind of came to her afterwards. I was like, I, I know that I wrote this for you, but like, I'd like to keep going with the story and see where it goes. And it morphed and changed, and none of those original three chapters are. are I like oh, so that's all. not that's not the same first it's three not, chapters of the book. No. It's not. Although some of the characters and ideas right, are okay. the same, it's very much a, an early, early first draft. Yeah. And I totally rewrote the start, mm -hmm. um, so it's completely different now. Different character names and everything, but it did serve as that wee seed to get me going. Yeah. And as I said, whenever I, I started writing like that, it was like I only need an audience. I want to keep yeah. me motivated. I always thought it would be hard to write, but actually, I'm just pure loving this. It's mm -hmm. so much fun. Um, and I was like, well, if I'm going to write it, I might as well try and do it properly. And I think I had that first thing that a lot of authors do where they test the water. So I had a first draft. I was like, right, how do you do this? So yeah. you, you send out to agents and open calls yeah. for smaller press and you send them the first three chapters and your query letter. Yeah. So I was going through all that. And, and I think because I got some proper feedback, which was like, no, this isn't good enough. But, yeah. you know, 
something like you're on the right line, you know that yeah. Brighton's 99% rejection. So the fact that a few people had read it and then thought about what was wrong with it and thought it was worthy of giving some feedback, you know. Yeah, there's something won't. there, isn't there? Because a lot of time you get nothing yeah. back or that's, you get a form rejection. So I think you're right. I think if someone's taking the time to see what they thought about it, yeah. that's a good sign. Then that's like... I started thinking, right, they're taking it seriously yeah. and I'm just messing about. <laughs> so I need to actually do this. And I always thought of myself as a bit of a lazy person, to be honest. But I think my perception's changed as I've got into writing and, and as I've really worked at it because I was like, right, I'm going to rewrite those first three chapters completely. I'm going to have a good go at this, look at the feedback that I've got. And when I came back to it, like six months later, mm-hmm. um, I had a really serious mentality in it. I took all the things that I do in my normal life, you know, like being really structured and organised, having good plans and stuff like that, and I applied that to sending out. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if you're a writer, like, writing the books, like, one third of it, the yeah. other third's pitching it. Yeah. You know, almost like writing your query letter mm-hmm. takes as much time as writing your book. <laughs> it has to be so perfect. Yeah, it's, um, it's been so much time going over and over these drafts of bloody one-page letters. I know, you start Yeah, yeah. 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 You start second-guessing, like, what a word, what, what does that, what does that mean? <laughs> Um, so yeah, trying to get done like five hundred word synopsis, and you're like cutting words out, and you're like, "Is this yeah. sentence? Does this still make sense? Does this still is make it? Yeah. Sense? Is, this, is, is it okay to have three semicolons in this one?" <laughs> yeah. And um, you were working the same time as doing this, were you? I was. Yeah. yeah, yes. But I mean, it felt like fun. You know, it was what I wanted to do at the end of the day. Yeah. Just coming home, desperate to to write more of the story. It's such a privilege, and I think that's the other thing. A lot of people come to you, and you, you know yourself as a couple of writers, like. Um, People say, "Oh, I'd love to write a book one yeah. one day," yeah. and it's always a bit of a laugh for anyone who who's put the work into doing that. Because if you'd love to do it, you would have done it by now. And that was the same for me in the past. I was saying, "Oh, yeah. I'd like to be a writer one day," but I, I wasn't serious about it. So yeah, if you're a writer, you're doing it. You know what I mean? Mm. No, definitely. I mean, I think there's with that. There's definitely a a, a sort of curve, isn't there? Because mm-hmm. you can sort of play about with it, as you said, and then. As long as you are disciplined at it a bit, I think you need to actually not treat it like a job as such, but you know, say I'm yeah. going to do this, even if it's once a week or or whatever. But you're starting to build on it. Yeah. And absolutely. once you get into that habit, I think it becomes easier, and then that's where the sort of yeah. it can really blossom from there. Yeah, I think there's like there's so much stuff which is hard, to, you know, which the end product is really good, but the actual to get to that point yeah. where it's like an instrument or whatever, mm-hmm. and you do need to be some kind of structure and, and, and say I'm going to do it and push through the bits the time that I can't be arsed and just yeah. just push through so um, the, presumably what we're talking about is what became Anna and Dreaming is that right? yeah yeah initially so like um, the first draft was way too long it was probably two books worth so you had to think really carefully I was like well obviously that's a big story that mm-hmm. I'm trying to tell it's stupidly ambitious mm. trying to write 300,000 words that whole <laughs> kind of wonderful magical system set myself all these stupid challenges as well like I decided I was going to write it in such a way that hopefully people would feel like it was written in their city without saying specifically yeah. if it was okay, in yeah. Scotland or England or America or whatever I don't know if that's successful but uh, no one's criticised it so far so <laughs> fingers crossed I, I did alright with that I tried to write a whole book that was specifically about um, a kind of magical system without ever using the word magic. Yeah, yeah. Another, I saw um, that the word magic doesn't appear once in the whole no, book, but no, even though it's, it's a very magical yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's used once in the dedication to um, at the start of Anna and the Moonlight Road, and I've given myself a, a pass on that yeah. one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was a big, stupid, ambitious project, and it was one big book, and I had to split it in two. So I had to find a point to to kind of split that, and then to kind of rewrite the start and the end so that there's a good arc. I, I like the idea of a story um, or a book in itself, even as part of a trilogy, having mm-hmm. a good kind of plot arc that resolves and doesn't just leave you on a cliffhanger. It's funny when I got to the end of Anna and Dreaming, I felt like, man, that's really like, you know, teasing for the next book. Mm-hmm. I think that's really good. People would be like, what's happening next? And my publisher, who are, who are amazing, my publisher's out all the press and they give me so much good feedback and, and help. But the one thing that they did say is like, oh, we, we thought there'd be more of a cliffhanger. I, like, I really feel like that <laughs> is a cliffhanger. So 99% of the, the, the kind of feedback and criticism I got from them, I, I kind of took on board. But that one, I was like, no, this is this is definitely the ending. Mm. You know, this is where it goes. Yeah. Um, so again, 
most people that have finished the first book have been quite keen to read the same mm-hmm. okay well, that's good yeah. um, so that's uh, so hopefully I was right that time yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a, oh sorry go for it. No. Oh, no, no, no no just because say that the there is that pool between what you want and what the publisher wants and stuff and knowing mm-hmm. when to stand your ground and when to listen to the advice yeah. that's quite hard I imagine well for me I got um, I was lucky enough whenever I did this properly and was a bit more serious about it to get a few offers of publication um, so although I went to some agents to um, the offers that I got were from smaller press, so it was a couple of different kind of um, publishers that had open calls for publication, and I had to weigh up the different ones, and mm-hmm. there was a few of them, I think one of them, I'm really glad I didn't go with, because <laughs> <laughs> a friend went with them and it was a disaster, oh, no. um, but the, the other two were really serious offers, and I had to weigh them up, and they were both really good, and I had good personal connections with the, the kind of authors that were working for those publishers that had recommended me had kind of championed my work and, and had wanted to, to take on the book. And the reason I went with Owl Hollow was because they didn't tell me this is perfect, this is great, yeah. we can't wait to get it out. They said, this is this is good, we really like this book, but we've got quite strong ideas about how you can improve it, make it better, mm-hmm. you can improve the writing. And that learning process with them was what I was looking for. Yeah. Yep. This is my, well, Anna and Dreaming was my first book, Anna and the Moonlight Woods my second mm. um but for me i wanted to to find a publisher that was going to help me make a better writer because like this yeah. is me i'm doing this from now on it's too much fun to yeah. stop <laughs> yeah. i love it and everything that i've done has built on the success of the thing before mm. yeah it's, it's just getting kind of more intense for me and um yeah i, I want to be learning the whole time getting better and do you want to tell us tell the listeners what the sort of synopsis for that and dreaming yeah, yeah. So I'll try and do it without too many spoilers. Yeah. So um, Anna's kind of a maybe a postgraduate student. She's coming to live in the city. She's had some really bad trauma in her recent history, which she doesn't really want to think about. Mm-hmm. And so it's left quite vague in the book. She pushes it to the back of her mind. But in the middle of this kind of difficult time living in the city, being quite isolated, being a bit of a loose end after maybe finishing her, um, her research, she uh, she's pulled into this magical world that she's not sure if it's real or not. So the, the instigating kind of factor in this has been slipped a date rape drug on a, a night out with her friend. So both her and her friend are drugged by this kind of creepy, sleazy guy called uh, Dean, the first experience fan of standing up to a creepy, sleazy guy, which mm-hmm. is very much the pattern as the, the story goes <laughs> forward. Um, it is unfortunately the pattern for many of the most amazing kind of women in my life that have inspired that character just standing up to horrible men um so yeah so that's that's kind of what starts this she finds herself hunted by these um monsters they're called night collectors and they're controlled by the kind of early antagonist of the book who's a a kind of a poet whose poems can become real so he Mm -hmm. makes these really macabre poems he's called the midnight man and he's an early kind of villain that Anna has to face and the first book's very much about her coming to realize that uh what's happening to her is real um, and she has some ability to fight back against these monsters. Um, she's saved by the, the second main character in the book, uh, a man called Tej. He takes her on and there's a bit of a tease at the start that, you know, it's going to be a kind of Doctor Who scenario. She's his loyal sidekick yep. chasing him mm-hmm. around as he goes on adventures. But he very quickly makes it clear that in the future, she's going to be the one protecting him because she's the one who's got the power to fight against these monsters and and really the onus is going to be on her to carve the way for both of them. And yes. it's the first part of a trilogy. Now you said when you first wrote it, obviously you had to cut it down because you thought it was effectively two. But did you have the whole... When you pitched it, did you pitch it as a trilogy or did you pitch it as one book with possible follow-ons? Or? So it was kind of... Kind of interesting that because I had to make some early business decisions mm-hmm. about contracts and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, so in my case, because I didn't have an agent, I was going directly to a publisher because I, I liked that publisher and wanted to work with them. Um, I joined the Society of Authors, which is a UK kind of society, and they gave me contract advice. Okay. I don't know, maybe a useful tip yeah. for some Yeah, people. definitely. They've given me contract advice and other things, including some of the, the video games that I've worked on. Mm-hmm. Well, I would normally say computer games, but I'm saying video games. <laughs> yeah. Potential American audiences, I think the video game, computer game battle has been lost. 
Chef Roll for Bingy. Um, but yeah, so I got some contract advice from the Society of Authors mm-hmm. um, and they kind of looked at the different offers. But but the offer that was put on the table for me from El Hollow was a kind of like deal that went up, um, kind of increased payments across a trilogy because they yeah. knew it was a trilogy. They really liked it, the book and they've championed it really well and they were keen on kind of seeing it out. Mm-hmm. So I kind of went back and forward, thought about it. You know, the advice from the Society of Authors was... Seems like a good deal, especially in comparison to, to, to some of the other ones. There was another kind of offer that I got that was pretty good and another one that they were very sketchy about, oh, okay, right, um, okay. which really helped me make the decision. Well, if you can tell, because it might be useful for the listeners, can you say what was sketchy about that? If you wanted, yes. don't feel you need to. You want <laughs> no, to. I think it's really good advice. Um, if anyone's getting a publication deal and they want to know who it was, you can send me a message and I'll have to discreetly <laughs> tell you if you're um, Scottish based. Um, so there was a, a promise of a huge p- initial print run. Right. So that was kind of one and a hardback print run, um, which isn't always normal for a smaller press mm-hmm. in a kind of speculative fiction, yeah. you know, um, fantasy, sci-fi genre. There was also no advance. Um, so that's kind of a warning sign. Mm. Obviously the biggest warning sign that you should just get out of there as if someone's asking you for money. Yeah, um, and totally. hopefully other authors would have said that to you and, and your your listeners would be aware. If anyone's asking you for money, then the, the dynamic is all wrong and yeah. get out of there. Um, but even then, there should be some advance. The advance doesn't need to be millions of pounds, doesn't even need to be tens of thousands of pounds. Um, but if there's no advance, then it represents a kind of lack of investment in you. That mm-hmm. advance on your on your royalties mm-hmm. is kind of like a um, kind of like a market trust on the yeah. part of the publisher. Yeah. They're like, we we trust you. We think this is something they're investing in it. And if they're going to invest some money in advance, they're going to be probably more likely to invest in publicity, yeah, in editing and feedback, mm-hmm. and giving you attention and care, um, not discarding you for their more popular authors and their stable or whatever. So yeah, so that was the warning signs for me. No advance, promise of a massive initial print run, sketchy business mm. case, um, very high, what's it called? Like, not the royalties, very high percentage, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which didn't seem to add up if you thought about yeah. the, the risk that they were taking with that massive okay. print run. So, yeah, I think, so all yeah, those yeah another thing that, I, that I've heard before as well is if they want to, you know, Pay attention to how long they want to hold the rights for and things like that. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if something Absolutely. doesn't, you know, yeah. do they lapse or because I've yeah. heard horror stories about they own the book for yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I know that like Marco, your kind of backgrounds in comics, isn't yeah. it? As well, where there's very particular things about that as well. Uh, okay. IP becomes a big thing, yeah. and there's lots of um, kind of publishing houses that just want to hoover up the IP. Yeah. Um. So there's things to be aware of. They are slightly different for books, but yeah, there's there's a lot of things. So get advice, you know, that's, yeah. that's my, that's my advice. That's, yeah, advice. that's, 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 that's a good that's tip. Good. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And, and you went to the publishers yourself directly. Was, was that someone you really felt quite strongly about to cut out the agent or did you, did you try with the agent path and then say, actually, nah, this isn't, isn't going to work? I just fired off a million emails. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just went down yeah. a big list. Yeah. I just made up a list of everyone that I wanted to work with and I put it in a big spreadsheet and ordered it by preference. Mm-hmm. you know so you put the ones that you really want to hit first and you yep. send to them first because you know a lot of people ask me about self-publishing too or about mm-hmm. publishing with indie press or traditional press or whatever and um different advice for different people but my feeling was always like why not take a shot with the the publisher that you want to work with yeah. you know because yeah. what's the worst that's going to happen they're going to say no if you believe strongly in your work and you want to self-publish further down the line or if you want to go for a smaller publisher or, or all these different kind of deals, you know, the book market's quite um, kind of diverse now. Yeah, There's different totally, yeah. ways to approach it. But shoot for the one that you want the most first, because, yeah. you know, what's, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah. No, definitely. And um, are you, going back to the writing process, um, you said, obviously this is a big epic story that you're telling. Did you... Are you a big planner or do you was it all up here and you just started writing it so. um yeah that's a good question so like uh for this kind of series that's got mm-hmm. all this terminology and quite a well-defined structure to the magical system it's all about artists remaking mm-hmm. realities so yep. it's about them using kind of the energy that's in the air and this 
cases called VIG is kind of like magical energy that they weave into whatever they're using so if it's a singer they can sing things into reality if it's a poet like the Midnight Man his rhymes create these monsters all these kind of different scenarios um, it would have been good for me to plan more than I did <laughs> <laughs> and I think that it meant a lot of rewriting and adjusting things which I love doing and I think to some extent the Matrix Fade trilogy is like a big open um kind of playground for me to explore yes yeah. because i'm interested in art and the effect that it has mm-hmm. on the real world and about how it can make the world better so that was a big part of it you know it was like just giving me the space to to have all these crazy ideas and just see where they go um i'm writing a, a dark fantasy um story now that's called hope is coming to your heart and it's um <laughs> yeah it's nice and cheery yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but it's uh it's because it's not set in the real world, it's going to require a lot more planning. So I might try your your uh, your Thank excellent you. product. Um, <laughs> That'll come in very useful. Yes, yeah. because I'm, I'm doing a lot of world building just now, so I'm thinking about the setting, the history, stuff that I thought I would love, because I've yep. always loved timelines, you know, like trolling through the Dune timeline, yeah. like, oh yeah, wow, yeah. this is what yeah. happened, or like, you know, for video games, Metal Gear Solid timeline, or yep. Dark Souls, or something like that. I love all that stuff, I love lore. Yeah. So I thought it would be really easy for me, but I find that I've got like just a bit of a block with it. I need a structure, so I'll try. I'll try mm. your um, try your book and try and kind of categorize that and come up with oh, some nice. character portraits. I think just stuff in Anna and Dreaming, like you know, my my publisher saying like you know what age is this character? Yeah. And you're like, well, I really should just <laughs> roll that down somewhere instead of having her a different age in two different yeah. parts of the book. <laughs> Thankfully, I think all of those are ironed out. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think a bit more planning. So it's what I'm trying. Maybe it won't work. Maybe yeah. I'll find that I can only kind of see it in my pants, right? Yeah. But I'm trying to plan. <laughs> and how many drafts time. do you tend to do when you're going through? Is it quite a lot of is it quite a lot of drafts until you think this is finally ready now, or is it? Yeah, just the like regular nine hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah. um, it's it's all these wee kind of different rewrites, isn't it? Yeah, so you yeah. know, you talk about your like. Um, Oh, what they call the different types of edits. So like dialogue your, pass or whatever. Yeah, or something yeah, like, totally. Yeah. And like your line edits towards yeah, the end, yeah. and you're just getting everything really tight, and the the prose really sharp, and you know, sentence to sentence sounding good. So yeah, so there's different layers, and I just go, you just go back through it over yeah. and over until you're sick of it, and then when you're like, there's no way I can do this anymore, you do it like ten times more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, um, but. Was it? You, did you show it to anyone before you got the editor at, at, at the publisher? Did, yeah. So different for different books. Right. I guess for the first book, um, just my wife uh, had read it and then maybe a couple of friends had had a look as kind of beta readers. Mm-hmm. And that was good. Um, I think with the second book, because I'd kind of joined the book community as a whole and yep. had more links, both with writers for the same um publisher Mm -hmm. and just on twitter getting to know people going to conventions you know kind of networking you get a bigger kind of network of people you support their work and they support you you know and that's Mm -hmm. a really valuable thing so for Anne in the moonlight road what my publisher suggested i do which was a really good move was to send off to some of those people that i really trust so um for that one like my beta readers i think was okay with me saying it was like benjamin thomas who's a really good um writer based in the states um, Amanda Evans who writes kind of similar stuff mm-hmm. to me mm-hmm. and Sherry Ficklin three different authors yeah. I kind of yeah. respected and liked they all read they gave me feedback um, and what you do if you've got three is it's really good because if two of them say the same thing then they're yeah. right yeah, yeah. and if one of them says something you look at it but you think mm, if I'm strongly against what they're saying I'll, yeah. I'll just stick with my instincts um, but as soon as two people are telling you the yeah, same yeah, thing totally. you're like uh, maybe there's yeah, something there something. I think Stephen King said something similar which was that you know, if one person tells you something yeah. wrong, you can, you, you know, as you say, sort of judge it, but yeah. you can ignore it if you want. But if 10 people tell you the same thing, then that's yeah. something yeah. you need to address. Yeah. I think Neil Gaiman has a good one as well. He says, when people tell you what's wrong with your story, they're right. Yeah. When they tell you how to fix yeah. it, they're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is good. Right. Yeah, I like yeah. that. So is it quite important, you think, going to the convention? You went to Chimera before you I'm started? I've not meant, been to many, to be honest. Yeah, that was the main one, and that was a really good experience because um, I got to kind of talk and tell people a bit about it, be up on stage. You got to kind of meet a couple of people. You had Gareth Pill on before. Oh, yep. yep. Um, he's really good, really positive force in the writing community. He gives mm-hmm, lots of good advice. He's always on Twitter. Um, don't know how he gets any 
Right, and done. Right, <laughs> need to ration my Twitter compared to compared to him. But yeah, so it was good to kind of network with some of those people. I think it's something I'd like to do a bit more. Um, it's hard when you're writing, though. Yeah. And like, yeah. It's just a, a really full on. I'm working on a, a game as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'd mentioned it's called Cloud Punk, and that's coming out this year. It's the second biggest cyberpunk game coming out <laughs> in 2020. <laughs> um, which you'd think wouldn't be that much of a big deal, but man. It, I mean, Any other year it would have been number one, but it's... Uh, yeah, 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 totally, yeah, totally wouldn't have, yeah. I've on. probably written for the third biggest game as well, yeah. so that's pr- pretty cool. But what is it, Cyberpunk? Cyberpunk 2077? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the other one. Never. Um, what happened at one point is Cloudpunk, when Cyberpunk 2077 finally went up on Steam, which mm-hmm. is a big store page for games, the first recommendation for a similar game oh, was Cyberpunk. Oh, was Oh, brilliant. So... You can be sure that, like we saw the the results of that when it came to like the wish lists. Oh, you know, that's people cool. That's actually not a bad, yeah, bad outcome. In the way. And then obviously you don't want to see anything delayed, and I hope Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven is great and it comes out and stuff. But it did get delayed, and that was another big thing because people were like, "Well, yeah. if you're waiting on that, you can play Cyberpunk." Get your yeah. Cyberpunk fix this way. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you? Um, is that are you writing that, or are you sort of? one of the creators helping form the world or have you written the story for that game? So for Cloudpunk I'm the lead writer and the narrative designer. I say lead writer because it sounds you know pure fancy. I'm the lead writer. <laughs> I'm the only one. <laughs> it's not like I've got an army of millions out there. Um, but yeah so that was a, a really cool experience. So I was I was writing for another game um, called Industries of Titan. I was just doing some kind of contract work for that. Mm-hmm. It was a good experience. I, I really loved it. They wanted mm-hmm. all these kind of short pieces of fiction, short stories. Um, to round out the world so that was very fun and after that wrapped up I was like man I, I'm, I've played games all my life yeah. like I, yeah. I've played far more games than I've read books um, and I, I studied that at uni I'm 40 now and I've played games for I suppose 35 years <laughs> from a ZX Spectrum with the rubber keys yep. um, so I've always wanted to do it it's on the list you know mm-hmm. um, along with maybe comics one day write a script you know all these pie in the sky ideas um, but anyway, so I'd, I'd always wanted how to write did you, How did you get that contract? I had like just out of yeah. interest. So it? yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. So I'd, I'd finished up doing some of the, the writing for um, uh, Industries of Titan and I just looked on Twitter for similar games and I saw Cloudpunk was in development. It was quite early in development. They were showing this concept art um, of this beautiful voxel city. Like mm-hmm. if anyone has a look at the trailer, that's really what, yeah. Yeah. what sells yeah, it. I absolutely. think it was a couple of gifts that hit as well on Reddit and it just went kind of viral front page. Just people really connected with that look. Yeah. Like, Man, this game looks amazing. I <laughs> just thought, I wonder if he's got a writer. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally just, I think I found his Facebook page. So his name's Marco as well, the lead mm-hmm. um, designer on. Um, Cloudpunk, the developer's called Iron Man, so I just sent him a message and says, are you looking for a writer? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Excellent, yeah. He, he was, and he says it's very early. He's like, but why don't you send me some of your stuff? So I think whenever I've written short fiction, it's always come out as sci-fi, I don't know why, yeah. um, but I, just if I'm writing short stories, they always come out as if you kind of sci-fi, dark horror things. So I sent him a couple of my stories that were in, in print, um, just PDF versions of them, and he was like, right, I like these, so why don't you kind of give me an idea for the story and I was like well what have you got so far and he's like I've got a big voxel city and that's it you know <laughs> all right so he's just oh, wow. concept it's, of the city it's like a mad that's a perfect type of game then, isn't it yeah it's so good because it's beautiful and it's a really solid game engine and it already felt good and he's like I've tried making it a kind of shooting game but the shooting wasn't working and I've decided I want to do something that's a bit more thoughtful mm-hmm. and a bit more about the everyday life of someone in a city um, so just sketch out so I gave him all these ideas and we just started world building together so That's I sent cool. him like uh, kind of this big idea for the story and he's like nope but I like some <laughs> of the ideas so I was like what about this my first experience of really working collaboratively yeah. mm-hmm. and I loved it I thought that like having so many restraints or constraints I suppose um, would, would limit me but that's another one of the things that I say in my, my talks whenever I'm doing it for kind of younger writers those constraints will often motivate you you know more than just saying write whatever you want yeah. you know it's like telling somebody what's your favourite song you're like, I don't yeah. know mm-hmm. what, what's your favourite movie if you say what's your favourite movie that's about this you know what's, what are you listening to right now Yeah. so it's those constraints that make it interesting so when kind of revised and at one point we'd be going back and forward so long I was like am I the writer now yeah. <laughs> he's like well yeah yeah you are um, so then it was just writing lots of dialogue and writing the missions and the stories is it a branching thing or like 
because that obviously brings its own challenges. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So that's a big part of kind of narrative design and the, the unique challenges of being a, a writer for video games is when things split, mm-hmm. you know, the problem space, you would call it, can quickly become intractable. So it can become so massive. So you see a lot of story-based games, like, you know, the Walking Dead yeah. games, the Telltale yeah. games. Yeah. They, they have this branching structure where they branch out, but then they funnel back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there is, there is that approach. That being said, Cloudpunk doesn't really do that. It's it's got choices and it does branch, but it's kind of all these vignettes. It's different characters that you meet and the outcomes of their life, what happens to them in this one night in the city will change based on the choices that you make. But it doesn't, because it's so open, it's kind of got different... Yes, I don't know if I'm That's explaining cool. it anymore. No. Yeah. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't get too crazy. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the choices don't get out of control. It's really just seeing the repercussions of the wee choices. That yeah. You make. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's got... Um, Nice. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you get the industry? Like, having not worked, having not written for compu- computer games, I'm saying that as well. Let, let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, um, bring it back. <laughs> um, uh, how did you get that first job for Industries at Titan? How did you get that one? Uh, just again, I think because I've got a little bit of a background in like writing about games, I've done right. some games journalism and stuff. I had quite a good follower list on mm-hmm. Twitter, or like good industry people and a few connections. Sometimes you would just see a kind of open call for me to write or for a kind of short term gig. So I think that's literally what it was. Somebody put that out. Mm. And, you know, once you've got some stuff in print, you've got something, some kind of portfolio yeah. to show, you can send people a copy of your book. I mean, that was the order I had on Andreeman, who was in print and out, and it was very visible. Yeah. So you've got that. I mean, not that you need to be an author or a novelist to get a game and uh, to get a job in games writing, but if you've got that, then you've got some legitimacy but yeah. then I suppose yeah. Um, yeah. And, you, and you were saying that you also teach writing classes now as well is that right no no I just kind of do workshops here and there right, okay, so, okay. so so what kind of workshops are they and how did that come about so it's through a couple of different channels so one of them is like the live literature database so the Scottish Book Trust okay. um, so they've got a really good programme where um, kind of libraries youth groups um, all sorts of different people can book for an author to come in I think because m- my work crosses across things that maybe younger people would be interested mm-hmm. in as well like video game computer games <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fantasy and sci-fi and stuff like yeah. that I kind of get asked to go along to those things also just talks and libraries and stuff like that um, across some of the computer games courses in Scotland as well because I would know some of the academic staff from um, universities and colleges mm-hmm. they'll do their, their one day narrative you know thing so they're largely learning about you know, rigging 3D models and animation and art and computer uh, programming and stuff, which mm. is all, to be fair, where most of the jobs go. But they'll often have a wee section that's just about games narrative. Yeah. So I come in and tell them, right, do you expect me to talk about Joseph Campbell? Because that's what I'm not going to expect. And I'm like, I'm not going <laughs> to. Just, just to be different. Um, so I do Joseph Campbell and then a big cross through it. And then the lecturer goes, oh no, I just told them about that last week. And I'm like, it's okay, but, you know, we're going to talk about both how you use those things to inspire your writing, but also how you can, you know, discard things you don't agree with, have yeah. your own thoughts and opinions on some of these models or templates that are shown to you. And yeah, try and emphasize the individual crea- creativity of the yeah. people, not to yeah. necessarily ascribe too closely to, to models or templates. It, it always fascinates me with games writing, how, how sort of separate from the process of the mm. game it is in some ways. Like, you're just saying there that he already had this city and world, but he didn't really know what he wanted to do mm. with it, which yeah. is incredible. And then we've spoken to people like Ian Dallas that did What Remains of Ian, he did first. Yeah, it's a great game. Um, yeah. uh, and again, that, the gameplay seemed to come first. The idea, they had a sort of concept. Like a diving but, game almost, yeah, wasn't it, at first? and then the writing came after, which I find incredible because that is one of the most impactful yeah you would think that they knew from the outset what they what, what was the experience they wanted yeah. but it seems like they didn't know what they were going until the writing yeah. came on and it sort of had, took it in a direction they had an idea for a theme that, or that that's they right. wanted to yeah. generate that yeah. feeling in the that's right yeah. succeeded, but, but they didn't have the writing yeah. there which, it's much more haphazardy yeah, than you would think it's you know. strange yeah. games development's a mess man it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's so strange yes some games they say that like they're only fun when they're ninety percent done. So can mm. you imagine working on a game for yeah. Yeah, five, six so hard, years yeah. and you're just imagining what it's gonna be like? 
That being said, there's like this whole school of thought that like you can make a creatable, a, a kind of what they call a vertical slice. So like yeah. a finished mm-hmm. portion of a game that's fun and enjoyable and represents the rest. Um, I think where Cloud Punk is kind of somewhere in the middle because although he had, um, although Marco had like this great world and a beautiful view, a beautiful aesthetic, yeah. you know, um, and a solid game engine that worked really well, so much of the creation of the assets has come after the story. So all the art, the characters, the voice acting, man, there's nothing as exciting as hearing people voice the lines, the lines and characters. Yeah, in yeah I can imagine that. Goosebumps and to be involved in that process of like the casting of it and stuff, to hear different people read the lines and say, that oh, one's not quite so good or or even better is that thing where a, a voice actor brings a character to life in a different way yeah, from how yeah. you thought, like that's better than I expected it to be. Um, and then sometimes that can prompt you to go back and change wee bits. Mm-hmm. So it is it's back and forth mm-hmm. very much. Um, I'm going to change the subject entirely now, but um, <laughs> uh, I was wanting to, you mentioned earlier on that uh, publishers can help you with publicity and stuff mm-hmm. and obviously when Anna and Regan came out I noticed that um, you you know you were on TV talking about it mm-hmm. and things like that was that all through the publisher that they managed to get and you got to Chimera or was that just you no that's just me oh, right. um, and, nice. and that's, that's again that's one of the balance of the things that I had to look at when I was choosing a publisher so mm-hmm. Isle Hollow is based in the States so if I lived in America they could kind of give me lots of links to conferences and kind of support me with those things and, and they were taking a bit of a risk on me as well because they were saying they'd never worked with a, a UK author before. Yeah. And sometimes there is a real split. Some people really quite specifically segment the UK and the US market. You'd think they're so similar, but there's yeah. really a, a delineation there when it comes to the publishing world. Um, so they'd have to think about that and they had to have a think about that as well, but they, they were keen to, to take a risk on it. I think I was... I don't know if pushy is the right word. I think I was motivated. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I quite like coming on podcasts. I like talking. Um, I've got a bit of experience. Of, like, you know, I, I did podcasts for games before. Yeah. I had good links with um, kind of the games industry and a little bit of the publishing industry. Um, yeah, so I, I'm all right at talking, as you can probably <laughs> if, if, if only in volume, if not necessarily in quality. No, um, but I, I but yeah, I was a, happy to push that. It, it. It's a big part of it, isn't it? Because... It's very few uh, authors, debut authors, will be lucky enough to have a publisher that says, right, we're going to market this. And Mm -hmm. what we've heard from even really successful authors is that if the publisher doesn't do something about your book and you don't do something about the book, it will just die. Yeah, It'll just go out there and it'll die. Yeah, there's so many books out there at the moment. You know, part of it... you said earlier that writing it's only one bit of the job, and it is, because I think a big part of it, even if you're not self-publishing, is pushing it as well yeah, totally. and that's something that actually when before we started doing these podcasts is, is something that i didn't fully appreciate how no, much absolutely it was necessary even when you're public yeah if you don't believe in the book who's gonna mm-hmm. yeah. you know what i mean like if you can't go and tell people i think this is pretty good um then it's not going to get anywhere we're really bad at doing that in this country though aren't we like yeah. scottish people yeah. that's generally true. We're, yeah. we're quite bad at pushing ourselves, and it's both a good and a bad trait um but yeah, you, you have to be like just confident in the quality of your own work. And again, this actually comes back to the contract and what was clear about what was expected of me and the publisher. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that people have picked up for, for Anna and Dreaming is like they really love the cover. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like won a couple of awards for like best new fantasy yeah. cover. It's a nice, um, it's, it's, it's a nice cover. Yeah, and, and like it's not really much to do with me. I told them an idea and I made like a Pinterest board with loads of different images. But the, the artist that went away and made that real and realised it did a great job so they've done that for me the publishers worked really hard with the editing you know literally hundreds of hours you know sometimes i feel like the the edits and the comments would take them more time than it would for me to instigate the changes that they yeah, suggested because yeah. it really they'd have good rationale they'd be like i think this character shouldn't say this because pure paragraphs yeah. of stuff in there telling me why and i'm like I agreed with you at the start, you know, but yeah. it's good that they're doing that because they're so careful. Yeah. So they've did the cover, they've did the the editing, they've, you know, printed it, they've got it on Amazon, mm-hmm. they've sent it out to all these Instagram influencers who have done beautiful photos. I mean, that's another thing I've been lucky of. Lucky in, if you if you go and look at, like, my Instagram, it's just um, Cam Down Tom. That's what I'm everywhere. Because <laughs> um, that used to be my wee website name. So Cam Down Tom, it's just all these amazing photos of like you know Anna and Dreaming being held up in like New York across section mm-hmm. up oh, in brilliant. the Alps yeah. in a mountain you know it's like amazing photos 
Um, and, and that's a good split as well because like it's half people that the publisher have sent out copies to because they're like, you do beautiful book pictures, so just make yeah. us look nice. Half people have just taken that on themselves because they've seen that and they're like, oh, Tom, I took your book to, you know, this amazing location. And that's that's, that's the, the you want that kind, kind of viral yeah, thing yeah. to take off by itself. And yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And, and obviously you've, you've been able to make a success to the point now where, am I right in saying you basically are completely writing as a, as a job full time now? No. No. Oh, I'm <laughs> terrible, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, um, that would be cool. But no, not not there yet. Um, so I had a I had a baby in oh, okay. um, in January. There, she was born on the first of January. Oh well, nice. So I had a lot more time at home, um, kind of on paternity leave, right? Okay, looking yeah. after the baby and stuff like that. And I thought I'll be at home, so I'll have more time to write. No. That's not. <laughs> that was very, very stupid and naive. No, I, I, I love my job, but I'm lucky in the, the, my, my day chain job where I work in student support in a university. I can go home and I'm not yeah. tired. I'm, yeah. I, you know, I've sometimes had a hard day, sometimes I've had an easier day, um, but I've got the energy to go home and just, you know, I play a lot of computer games, I watch a lot of movies. If I just take a slice of that and say, see, instead of playing this game that I'm not even that interested in, Maybe I'll just write a bit of my story today. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's a privilege to write, you know? Like, if you don't feel like you're loving the writing process, I don't know how you're going to get through everything else because those edits are going to yeah. kill you. <laughs> you know, people say that they're stuck on, like, their, their writing and, it, you know, writer's block's a thing and it's tough to get through, but, like, I just love writing. Mm-hmm. It's just so much fun. And when you get the edits, actually, do you, do you ever get edits back that you're... Uh, well, you said the cliffhanger, I suppose that was one, but that where you disagree with it and sort of stand your ground or do you do you do what a lot of us do I think which is immediately sort of stand back and go that's wrong that's wrong that's wrong and then sort of think yeah a week later yeah. <laughs> yeah damn it <laughs> they were completely yeah. right you kind of just answered to your yeah. own question yeah. There, I mean, yeah and it's just the same thing I was going to say so you, it's very hard I used to think I was really good at getting constructive feedback and I was like <laughs> I'll be so good at this I'll just be like yeah. reasonable I'm quite chilled most of the time but it's what you said you put so much of yourself into something like that mm-hmm. and if you don't then you're not doing it yeah. properly so you have to put everything that you've got in it and then when it comes back and somebody goes mm, this bit doesn't really work it's hard not to take it personally because yeah. there's so yeah. much of you in there but you just need to do it the next day you just you look at the comments you let them brew and you close your laptop. You don't send the email. Mm. You don't start writing in red text. No, you're wrong. <laughs> you need to let it sit with you for a yeah. bit. And you'll probably find that if somebody's not understanding something, you, you can address that not by explaining why they're wrong, but there's something you can do in yeah. the text. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, but that being said, there are still sometimes, I think especially with my publisher, um, there would be sometimes cultural reference points that would be different. Yeah. So that's a thing to yeah. watch out for. Mm-hmm. You know, like if I need to change the pavement to the sidewalk or the boot to the trunk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like, you know, I had a bit where um, at the start, Havana and Dreaming, uh, Lady Almeria, who's one of these dreamers, these people that can change reality, comes out with a plate of biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's seen an old woman and it's like this kind of old house that they're in. And my, my publisher's like, biscuits? Like with gravy <laughs> I don't think, oh, right, no okay. no so cookies like, what's, what's your equivalent and they're like yeah like like cookies like really t-. but I'm like but cookies but like not nice <laughs> because I was going for like old oh, dried up Gary Baldy <laughs> like old person biscuits or nice. something so they're like what about like oatmeal and raisin I'm like yes no one likes oatmeal and raisin that's the ones that we need so yeah so those, those are things but, but there are other occasions where I'm just like no I need to be a bit firmer on this sometimes they'd be like we need to explain this a bit more and sometimes I'd be like, I'm happy with that being an illusion that maybe people don't get, but yeah. some people do get yeah. it because you'll read past it if you don't. And if you do, you'll feel a bit clever. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 and I suppose there is the sort of difference between something which is, isn't actually working and something which needs maybe something else put in before or after it to make mm-hmm. it click properly or to make it flow better and stuff. And so you can still have it in there and it's knowing yeah. what to chop out and what just to... Yeah. augment a little bit to make it work and I suppose that's the difficult part when you're doing your redrafts that's it um, and would you want to you, you've got so you've got Anna and Dreaming and Anna in the Moonlight and then the third part is coming out mm-hmm. when's that out uh, good question okay <laughs> <laughs> so Anna and the Moonlight Road was definitely later um, so my publisher uh, at the time that Anna and Dreaming came out Hill Hollow was relatively new so they'd had like maybe two or three books out before it mm-hmm. I was kind of one of the early ones and kind of helped them um, 
at, at the early stage fill out their catalogue and then as it's went on they've got so many more books now so they've really grown exponentially mm -hmm. it meant that like they were shuffling their releases around a bit yeah. so um, it could have been even later but I think one of their big fantasy books that they were working on got shifted and Anna and Dreaming came forward a little uh, Anna and the Moonlight Road sorry came forward a little bit so yeah it's all the shifting back and forth yeah. I mean theoretically I suppose it should have been coming out in summer but Anna and the Moonlight Road's only just out, right. and there's there's a lot of work to be done on, on book three. Mm -hmm. For is it, example, is it... a title. <laughs> <laughs> so I would I expect I, I, I wouldn't yeah. be confident in doing a release date for it. Okay, is it, are you is it in the process of being of being written now? Is it, you've got like a rough draft? Got a it? first draft. First draft. Okay. But yeah, would be would be a first draft that I would be keen on. You know when your like parents are coming over and you have to tidy the flat? <laughs> it's a bit like that. There's a lot of tidying that needs to yeah. be done before and, before anyone lays eyes on it. And you said you're working on another book at the moment as well, or a story. Is it a short story? Or is it a, no, it's a book, a book, so it's maybe the first part of a dark fantasy trilogy. Nice. Um, yeah, so it's called Hope is Coming to Your Heart. I've been thinking about different ways to pitch it. It'll maybe change a million times. So is, is that going to go to the same folk? Is that going to go to Owl Hollow as well? Or are you going to pitch that somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't have any market in mind yet. Um, it's only, you know, maybe a few, how many words were written? Probably like 20 or 30,000 words. Okay, so it's very early days. Quite yeah. sketched out. Yeah. I've, I've enjoyed doing the world building, so I've kind of pitched that as like something like uh, Brian of Tarth from Game of Thrones, you know, uh -huh. Brian of Tarth. Yeah. Is a mortal and comes back from the cave a thousand years later after being stabbed in the bri Briar Brother to uh, seek out for revenge. Cool. Yeah. Nice. So I take it your deal with Al Hollow for Anna and Dreaming Books was just for the three? Was that, was that it was, was yeah. 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 Um, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure. I'd like to think that mm. they'd be interested in anything else, yeah. right? But also, you know, I would have to think about when that story's complete, it could change so much that it wouldn't suit their market. Yeah, yeah exactly. It could suit that, someone else. True, yeah. yeah, you never know. And would you, apart from the books uh, and the games, <laughs> is it, you know, have you got any desire to write in other mediums like screenplays or comics? Or I would love that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got, you know, I think like most of us have got like a list of, you know, goals you'd like to yeah. achieve, um, mm -hmm. kind of aspirations and stuff. Maybe you do that when you're approaching 40. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a go at screenwriting um, and I've not even tried that. But, you know, it's so exciting to, to take on some of those challenges. I've never did game writing before. It was total, you know, shot in the dark. And it was so fun to learn how to do that. Um, and it was the first time working on something collaboratively, like my writing before that and just being by myself. So working as part of a team was really good fun. So I'd love to do some screenwriting. I'd love to take the plunge like you and, and try um, doing some work in comics as well one day. Mm -hmm. That would be good. <laughs> What was the last book you read? So I'm in the middle of reading Romance of the Three Kingdoms, oh, which right, I've always yeah. wanted to try, and I thought it would be a bit impenetrable, but I'm giving it a go, and I'm quite enjoying it so far. So I don't know if anyone knows, but that's a kind of really foundational um, text in Chinese mythology, so it combines history and uh, myth and legend and... I don't know, I guess it's about like their King Arthur or something like that. Okay, yeah. um, so it's, it's really cool. It's the foundation for so many comics and games and, and stuff. So I thought I'd go to the source and read the, the, the actual book of that. And I'm quite enjoying it so far. Nice. It's, um, is that the thing that's to do with Monkey and all that sort of stuff? Or is that a that's Journey to the West. Ah, right. So they, they sometimes oh, talk yeah. about the that, three... That's what I was thinking about. Thinking yeah, I, that, I'd yeah. like to read that as well, mm. actually. But they sometimes talk about the three or the four kind of... Um, foundational texts of Chinese mythology and Journey to the West is one of them and Romance of the Three right. Kingdoms is right, another. Okay. It's about this particular time and I'm going to massacre this. All the <laughs> historians are going to get annoyed at me but it's roughly about this time in Chinese history where the empire splintered so the Han Empire ended and there was these kind of three warring states um, and it was this time of heroes and legends and magic and it's, it's very cool. Mm, it um, nice. I'm also reading Berserk, the, the comic series, so it's oh, a Japanese yeah, yeah. comic um, and it's often cited as an inspiration, well, it's been going for so long, cited as an inspiration for everything but for like, for Dark Souls video game, mm -hmm. um, yeah and it's really brutal and it's very, yeah, it's very intense, very visceral, um, I'm quite enjoying it but it is a heavy read. Again, it's, yeah, 
You need to be in the right mood for it. <laughs> watch something cheery, you need to have to watch something <laughs> yeah. dark. Uh, and what's the last film you've watched? Oh, what's the last film that I watched? I saw the the last one that springs to mind is a Joker movie. Oh, yeah. Um, which I, I, I quite liked. I don't know. I think like that genre of um, kind of very based in the real world superhero mm-hmm. movies can be really interesting. Like I liked the f- maybe the first half of Kick-Ass, if you remember that yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. When it, it felt like it was doing this weird juxtaposition of what we think superheroes yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it goes very comic book It goes very it, yeah, yeah. and Mr. Yeah, 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 absolutely. The end. But I like that. And I don't know if you've seen the movie Super. I think it was called yeah. Super with Rain Wilson. Yeah, I've noticed, I know of it though. It's been uh, kind of similar to Kick-Ass, isn't it? A yeah, guy yeah. starts becoming a bit of a vigilante. Yeah, something. really strange. Shut up, crime. That's what, that was his catchphrase. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess... I felt like it played a bit in the same vein as that. It was definitely like evoking seventies era Scorsese, yeah. Yeah. very explicitly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I felt like the strongest parts of that movie were when it wasn't about Batman. You know, I, I felt like they could. I think it's obvious that the director or, or the writer. I think it was writer director, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it was obvious that he wasn't dead keen on doing a superhero movie. Well, they maybe pushed Watched in the Thomas Wayne, and Bruce Wayne stuff. Yeah, yeah. Over. I didn't. I didn't feel like that added much, but um, yeah, so I fairly enjoyed. And uh, last TV show or TV show that you're watching at the moment? Um, so, I've been watching a lot of Gundam. Because <laughs> um, there's like these kind of really uh, kind of kids shows that I missed. Yeah. That I'm trying to go back and watch. Because, you know, I watch a bit of anime and I watch quite a lot of sci-fi and fantasy stuff so a while ago I was like I'll go back and there's I'll about 1200 to... million oh, there's seasons, so many that? spin-offs and yeah. stuff so I went back and I tried to watch Dragon Ball Z it was the first one <laughs> like I've never watched that is there something there you know, like that kind of because I like to go back to things that have strong nostalgia and say like is there something there now yeah you you know? still is it now? saying yeah, anything yeah. And, and I did find it funny at times and weird at times and very dated and like lots of really inappropriate humour um but I didn't get into it, so I was like, right, okay. So it was interesting, but I can't watch any more of this. So I'm going to give Gundam a go. And I love Gundam. Like, oh, I like big enough. robots and mechs yeah. and stuff. I used to play the Battletech tabletop oh, game yeah, okay. when I was growing up. So I loved all that stuff. So I, I did find, in Gundam, like, if, I, if I've got a Gundam expert at any point, I'll go through which ones I like and which ones I don't. You know, there's lots of, um, <laughs> lots of good stories, lots of mature stuff about, like, the horrors of war. I think that yeah, was... Yeah. And you can see lots of the... Japanese psyche about the, the effects of the Second World War and how that comes through. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, so it's not not just one giant robot smashing the hell of another one. Is well, it? some some of some it is. is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and like you said, there's so many different series. So some of them are really kind of yeah. And the the shifts in tone can be quite awkward from yeah. one series to the other. It's one minute is selling you these hilarious toys, the next it's you know orphans being murdered and. Yeah. Cold blood and, and I think the only what? big robot I think I ever watched was Neon Genesis Evangelion. Yeah. which I thought was amazing actually. Apart from the end, I didn't understand. What the the it, end but. is nuts. I, I again when I was talking about. Um, plot and lore earlier on that yeah. was another big rabbit hole I filled in like yeah, Neo Genesis just, Evangelion yeah it's, it's yeah. just mental that one yeah and what it's doing Evangelion is is commenting on Gundam you know so if you've got that idea of roughly what Gundam was about this space opera it's very Star Wars mm-hmm. and Evangelion was deconstructing a lot of that stuff right, I okay. think and kind of commenting on it and being a bit more kind of reflective on, on what that meant yeah cool so, uh, so I think we always end the veil aspect with an either or type Question. So I'll just jump in with uh, Sandman or Fables. Ooh, Fables. Nice. <laughs> but uh, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049 on Cyberpunk. Uh, <laughs> I watched Blade Runner 2049 recently for the second time and I really enjoyed it and find it hard to sit through the original Blade Runner. Okay. Such a foundational thing, you know, yeah. the old Blade Runner. Do you want big long answers for these, by the way? No, go for it, yeah, 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 yeah. go for it. <laughs> you really, you really got me going now. <laughs> so, like, there's there's stuff in Blade Runner that hasn't aged well. You know, yeah. there's, like, yeah. gender dynamics that are sketchy, you know, yeah. in, in the modern day that I, I don't like. Um, but it's so foundational. I, I also feel that there's, like, a, an aspect that kind of, like, the fear of Japan that's such a present thing in Blade Runner you know it's it's seen as an aesthetic in cyberpunk now like having mm-hmm. you know noodle bars and yeah, lots, of, lots of kind of yeah. um, Japanese people and Japanese writing and signs but it was it was a dystopia at the time it was seen as like 
it was commenting in America like we're out of time and mm-hmm. the future is going to be Japanese because they're exceeding us in yeah, you know, a, technology uh, yeah, yeah. and it's economy and stuff. Point, yeah. um, and that's that's not the way that we look at the world now. Um, so 2049. Well, fair enough. Uh, TV or cinema? Hmm. I like going to the cinema but I haven't been to see anything for ages. And the last <laughs> thing that I saw was Star Wars. So I'm a bit down in cinema right <laughs> now. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I... Oh, I'll go TV, I suppose. Fair enough. Yeah, I wasn't a massive keen on the last Star Wars himself, I have to say. Man. Yeah, I had to go on a like two hour rant to my pal. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I agree with you. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up, man. Stop talking. talking. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've still not seen it, actually. Uh, yeah, all right, just make up your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, last one a uh, real book or ebook? I like a real book. Uh, and it's funny, I, I'm buying much more comics and graphic novels than books just now. Um, so, yeah. I just I like them on the shelf. I've got a nice shelf. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. got caps. So it, there's something nice about having them on a shelf. Yeah. You've got you get nothing against stuff. ebooks yeah. either, or people getting books from the library. Libraries are amazing. Yeah. And yeah. If you if you want to read my book and you can't afford to go to the library, I'd, I'd love that. Mm-hmm. And we should also probably add that. Am I right in saying that if you, someone does get a book from the library, the author still gets a small yep the, cut the of it or public something? lending. I don't know. It's a program. Yeah, yeah. so I'm signed up for it as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not going to put my kids through college. No, but it's a little bit. Yeah, yeah it's, so. it, and so you shouldn't feel bad about that. And I think any author who who has a hard time with you reading their books from a charity shop or from a library should just go up. And if people are reading my book, I'm dead happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although, how do you feel about it? I suppose linked to that would be the growing thing of um, e-book piracy. Mm. Yeah, that is more difficult. Um, I don't know. I don't know how many people that would pirate my book would have been going to buy it, and that's how they've always made the mm-hmm. argument in the in the industry, isn't it? Yeah. It's like you've lost this many sales. Yeah. I don't think that's accurate. Um, I think you still do need to jump through hoops to do it. Presumably, go to web, dodgy websites. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. The easier it gets to get your book into people's hands. Um, the less piracies are. Yeah, yeah I think. absolutely. Yeah, um, iTunes, etc. Yeah, so my book goes on sale. Kind of pirate Spotify, you know, and Spotify and stuff. Yeah. If you're like honestly, if you're gonna pirate it and you're that desperate, but you just really want to read it, just send me a message. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go, listeners. There's a there's, so, there's your. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't need all the way to the end can, can yeah. get that. <laughs> Well, I think there was a lot to unpack there. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was like I said at the start, I mean, it, it is really interesting how he's broken into both novel writing and the game industry in a way that isn't what you would call the conventional path, I think. No. You know, he's, he's, he, he didn't have an agent for his books and he's approaching these small press publishers, obviously, is quite a good idea. But I thought it was really interesting what he was talking about. You know, it sounded like he had a few offers from small press and he... he had to get contract advice from the Society of Authors and stuff like that. You know, that I thought that was really practical, useful advice yeah. for for people yeah, that are starting it was, out. It was a place I hadn't really ever thought about going to for that sort of advice. And mm-hmm. I think, as he says, it's really important if you're starting out and you're doing it yourself, that there are places out there you can go to for help with. Because, you know, the contract's such an important part. You yeah. hear horror stories yeah. of being ripped off by vanity publishers etc so so yeah if there's any way to to get help from that that's a great avenue yeah to do. and like that the society of authors is uk based but i think there's a, equivalents in in the us and, and elsewhere around the world as well so you know definitely if you are starting out as a novelist and you're being offered a contract and you want advice do check out whoever the central body is in your country yeah it's also interesting that We've had 35 episodes now. No, 34. Sorry. 34. It's getting ahead of yourself. We've right? had <laughs> 34 episodes so far. And, you know, everyone, you go online and you read about how to break in and you get this very same advice mm-hmm. of go to agents, do this letter and how, what to avoid, what not to do. And so many people that we've chatted to have done, have just yeah. thrown that out and done their own thing and been very successful with it. And it does show you that there isn't really a one size fits all approach well, to breaking into this industry. I think in a way it comes down to what Thomas epitomised, I thought, which was believing in yourself and really putting yourself out there. You know, just approaching people and 
speaking to them about whatever it is that you're working on and seeing if you can help them. I mean, the way he got the cloud punk gig was, oh. was incredible. You know, yeah. just writing and seeing if they wanted to lead right or having seen about the game. So, you know. And that, and that's, that costs nothing. That's mm-hmm. it. Anyone can do that. Anyone can reach out and, yeah. So so why not? You've got nothing to lose. No, exactly. Exactly. And I think sometimes, certainly personally speaking, you can always, you're worried about them thinking, who are you? Why would I want yeah. You know. Yeah. But uh, what's the worst that can happen? They say, no thanks. And that's it. You move yeah. on. So. You know, do put yourself out there. Do believe in your own writing, I think, is is what to take from that. Um, Speaking about putting yourself out there, Marco. Yeah, well, uh, (laughs) what a a smooth segue, Tarek. Um, (laughs) As I said at the start, there is a competition to win uh, two signed copies of Anna and Dreaming. So two of our listeners can win those. And you'll also win a page one writer's notebook as well. And all you need to do is uh, we will post a tweet about this on Twitter and all you need to do is like that tweet, give us a follow on Twitter and then retweet it. And if you do all those three things, then uh, you are entered into the competition. We'll run the competition for a couple of weeks. Uh, The exact date will be on the tweet and we'll uh, announce the winner after that or the winners since there's two of them. (laughs) Uh, Who's on next week's podcast, Tarek? Next week we have a very exciting guest on, Chris Brookmeyer. He's yeah. a, a very popular Scottish crime author, although he's done, as you will hear, he's done a fair bit of kind of sci-fi video yeah. game dabbling as well. Yeah, he, he was... I, I actually remember when his first book came out, Quite Ugly, one morning, because it, there was quite a big deal of that because he was only 26 at the time and, mm-hmm. and it was a big hit and stuff. Um and yeah, he's released a whole load of books, but certainly the the early books were really quite irreverent and satirical, uh, as well as being great crime novels. And then he sort of developed a, a more serious tone as he's got older, but his books are still really gripping. So yeah. uh, I really enjoyed the chat we had with Chris. So it's yeah, definitely it's one it's worth, worth tuning in for. Um, the only other thing to say before next week is my weekly beg for some ratings <laughs> um as you know for the love that, of god please yeah, please give this guy exactly. some, some reviews um uh well we are sitting on five stars on apple Podcasts, so it's, it's fine we're doing <laughs> well we're podcast. doing well but um <laughs> the more ratings the better it helps us go up the charts and the podcast everything we do here is free we're not you know i know some podcasts ask for money to keep going and stuff we're not but we do get better access to guests the higher up we are in these rankings so if you can spare literally 10 seconds to give us a rating on apple podcasts preferably five stars but we'll leave that up to you (laughs) and if you want to leave a review that's even better as well so we would really appreciate that well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm-hmm.